Dr. Seth Brundle. How did it feel going through? What did it feel like? It felt like a stutter. What? A, a stutter, a uh, hiccup, a slight um, dislocation of my physical life. Not unpleasant, just a little interruption of rhythm. First, I thought it didn't work. I thought I was in the same telepod I started out in. That footage, filmed in June 1985, is from the video diary of Seth Brundle, a brilliant young scientist, as he discusses the results of his latest experiment. Later that same year, Brundle would disappear from his makeshift lab in the industrial areas on the outskirts of Toronto, never to be seen again. The official reports describe an industrial accident resulting in his death, but leaked documents and photographs, fragments of video footage, computer logs, and statements from those who knew him suggest something far darker. Seth Brundle was born in New York in the early 1950s, a gifted but isolated child who showed a strong interest in physics and biology. By his early 20s, he was already regarded as a prodigy, publishing papers that caught the attention of private research firms. Socially awkward and obsessively driven, Brundle chose to work outside of universities, preferring independence over prestige. That independence, however, came with a cost. He relied on outside funding, which eventually tied him to a company called Bartok Industries. In this leaked recording from early 1985, Brundle talks firsthand about his work and how he sourced funding. How could you do this alone? Well, I don't work alone. There's a lot of stuff in there I don't even understand. I'm really uh, a systems management man. I farm bits and pieces uh, out to guys who are much more brilliant than I am. I say, build me a laser this, design me a molecular analyzer, that and they do, and I just stick them together. But uh, none of them knows what the project really is. So. And uh, the money, Bartok Science Industries finance stuff? Mm -hmm. But they leave me alone because I'm not expensive. And uh, they know they'll end up owning it all, whatever it is. So. The company he mentioned, Bartok Industries, was a shadowy biotechnology and defense contractor that rose to prominence during the late Cold War. Publicly, it positioned itself as a forward-thinking research company, specializing in genetics, materials science, and experimental computing. Privately, however, Bartok had extensive government ties, providing research with direct military applications. Its vast resources allowed it to fund independent scientists like Seth Brundle, often in exchange for quiet ownership of their discoveries. Anton Bartok, the elusive head of Bartok Industries, was known less as a public figure and more as a shadow behind the company's vast operations. Rarely photographed and almost never interviewed, Bartok cultivated an image of distance and control, preferring to operate through proxies and board members. Those who dealt with him directly described him as calculating, ambitious, and utterly pragmatic. Someone who saw scientific progress, not in terms of human benefit, but in terms of power and profit. Brundle lived and worked in isolation for almost a decade, until he met Veronica Quaif, a reporter at Particle Magazine. Particle Magazine was a niche but respected science and technology publication in the 1980s, known for translating complex research into stories for a wider readership. Veronica's early reporting and the accompanying leaked video footage provide some of the only known notes about Brundle's experiments. According to Quaife's notes, Brundle had been working on devices he called telepods, pictured here. The telepods were large cylindrical chambers designed to transmit matter from one to another. They broke down matter to pure data, or what could be called atomic level code, before reassembling it elsewhere. According to the limited amount of information we have, his early attempts at teleporting organic matter failed, resulting in it being warped and destroyed in transit. How many of these failed tests were recorded, we may never know. Official files were destroyed, and the few surviving accounts contradict one another. Some insist that Brundle's journals documented horrifying mutilated creatures. Others claim those journals were altered or even forged by Bartok after the fact. What we do know is Brundle was frustrated by these failures, as we see in this video journal filmed shortly after another failed test. I've got to do this, Seth. Talk to the tape, get in the habit. The world will want to know what you're thinking. is what I'm thinking. 
Good. The world will want to know that. What else? Why didn't it work? I think it uh, turned the baboon inside out. Can't deal with the flesh. It only seems to work with inanimate objects, nothing that's living. Must be my fault. Why? Computers are dumb. They only know what you tell them. I must not know enough about the flesh myself. I'm going to have to learn. But by mid-1985, Brundle claimed to have solved the problem. He successfully teleported a baboon, alive and unharmed. Veronica's notes detailed his excitement. He was like a child who'd solved a puzzle no one else could. Strangely, no scientific paper was ever published, nor were any patents filed. Bartok's name, however, appears repeatedly in internal memos tied to Brundle's work. Some speculate Bartok intended the technology for military applications, such as instant troop deployment, weapons delivery, or biological warfare. Impatient and intoxicated by his success, Brundle decided to test the machine on himself. The result should have been historic, the first human teleportation, but he wasn't alone in the chamber. A common housefly entered the telepod with him. According to the leaked computer logs, the machine, unable to distinguish between man and insect, fused their genetic material into one hybrid organism. At first, Brundle appeared enhanced, faster reflexes, superhuman strength, and sharpened intellect. He spoke further about the changes in this video. Well, it should feel exactly the same as before, but uh, I don't know, I feel very uh, energized, very coordinated. I feel as though I, uh, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, I work better physically. Why should that be? I don't know, it's possible that the, uh, the teleporter has somehow uh, improved me. You know, I told her to be creative. Maybe it has been. Could this ever be dangerous? It feels too perfect to be dangerous. You like how it feels? Yes, I do. You want to try it? But soon, the mutations grew visible. His fingernails fell out and his skin blistered. According to Quaif, Brundle believed his DNA was unraveling and reassembling into something not quite human. We don't know how much of this is fact and how much is reconstruction from secondhand testimony. The full logs of Brundle's transformation, if they ever existed, have never surfaced. But we do have this leaked video footage of Brundle explaining the mishap. Notice the drastic changes in his appearance, which lends credence to his claims. supposed to be two separate genetic patterns and it decided to uh, splice us together. My teleporter turned into a gene splicer. I'm a very good one. Now I'm not Seth Brundle anymore. I'm the offspring of uh, Brundle and Housefly. His condition quickly worsened even further as seen in this final known video fragment recorded in August 1985. How does Brundle fly eat? Well, he found out the hard and painful way that he's very much the way a fly eats. His teeth are now useless because although he can chew up solid food, he can't digest it. Brundle fly breaks down solids with a corrosive enzyme. In the following weeks, what happened in the lab is unknown. But we do know by September 1985, Seth Brundle had disappeared. Bartok agents were seen going in and out of his lab. His equipment was stripped, his journals were taken, and his body was never accounted for. There were only two people outside Bartok who saw the truth unfold, Veronica Quaif and Stathis Borans, Quaif's boss and the editor of Particle magazine. Unfortunately, most of Quaif's notes and recordings which should have exposed everything, vanished along with Brundle. Whether she suppressed them out of fear, or whether Bartok made sure the story never got out, remains an open question. Stathis Borans, who suffered severe injuries which he claims were at the hands of Brundle, has remained almost completely silent about the incident. 
but did confirm Quaife was pregnant with Brundle's child, a fact that would have made her a target for Bartok Industries. Some say Veronica left the country, while others claim Bartok agents shadowed her until she too vanished. The paper trail ends abruptly with no official explanation. If any further information on her fate comes to light, I will follow this up in another video. Thanks for watching.